Welcome everybody to this webcast. Today we are going more into the technical details, how to design a solution with Spectrum Protect using Spectrum Scale as storage device, essentially. Before I get started, just a short disclaimer. So this presentation will not explain in detail the architectures and concept of Spectrum Scale and Spectrum Protect. I'm just assuming you're familiar a little bit. Understanding of Spectrum, the architectural understanding of Spectrum Scale and Spectrum Protect is required to understand guidance we are giving here. Also the guidance I'm giving here more of a general nature, but each implementation will have its own challenges and these challenges may not even be covered in this presentation. Once you're familiar with the basic concepts I'm explaining here about solution design and sizing, you should define designing solutions in other environments with, with Spectrum Protect and Spectrum Scale. So what are we covering today? I give a short recap to the solution, uh, essentially, then I will uh, elaborate on solution design and sizing. Okay, here we have the guidance in a, of a general nature, uh, and at the end I will explain the example implementation we did for one of our clients, uh, which also became a client reference now. Okay, so the context of this solution is that we have multiple Spectrum Protect instances storing data in a database and storage pools in the Spectrum Scale file system. As shown in this picture here on the right hand side, we have multiple TSM instances running on uh, spectrum scale nodes using the spectrum scale file system for database storage pools and logs. So all instances share all file system resources. Spectrum protect instances run on spectrum scale cluster nodes so they can directly access the file system and the, the underlying disk storage. The spectrum scale file system provides a global namespace and balances the workload and the capacity for all tiers and instances. So if one instance needs more, it can get more if another one need, needs less. So with this solution, uh, it provides a standardized, scalable, and easy to use storage infrastructure for multiple instances. So this is the context we are talking about. Now let's look into solution design. So this is some, giving you some general guidance and I broken down the solution design sizing phases in four phases. The first one is create a create client requirement baseline. So we catch the requirements from the client he has, account for crows, and we create a requirement baseline. The next phase is going to be a solution design based on those requirements. After we have a high-level solution architecture as an outcome of the solution design, we do the sizing of the components. And at the end, of course, we have some co configurational guidance for that solution. Now let's start with the requirement baseline. We have developed this little checklist here where you can gather the requirements for each TSM instance. Okay, so from the client side, we had four of these tables fill out with the details for each instance. Now the requirement is around backup throughput, the restore throughput, which can essentially derive from the daily backup volumes from the maximum amount of restore within a certain time period. And of course, the capacities of the database of the storage pools high availability requirements of that solution, so is it going to be a dual site solution for example, what kind of disaster protection techniques are uh, used. If you use this sheet and enter the requirements for each Spectrum Protect ins, you have a good baseline. Okay, this was the capturing client requirements, so, so now we know the details for each TSM instance and we can go into solution design. So the solution design really has to be the goal to establish a high-level solution architecture where we have components arranged in, in a certain way which essentially represents the solution. There are certain things we have to, to do during solution design. We have to select a deployment option for Spectrum Protect on, on Spectrum Scale. We have to select a replication option if the client needs high availability or disaster recovery. Then the next thing is we establish a Spectrum Scale Spectrum Protect building block. And then we, we select the infrastructure for this building block. Once we have done this, we can establish a high-level solution architecture. Deployment options for Spectrum Protect and Spectrum Scale, we, we, there are essentially three options you have. One is, and this is the one we see most often with Spectrum Protect deployment, that the, the Spectrum Protect servers run directly on the NSD server. So it's shown on the rightmost, on the left-hand side, we have NSD servers and they all run uh, one or more TSM instances. The good thing here, they all use shared storage attached via SAN. Okay, so we really have the low latency 
bandwidth link TSM servers to the storage. Uh, typically, this deployment is used when it's a dedicated cluster for Spectrum Protect. One advantage of this deployment option is that if you want to do Spectrum scale replication, you can use the SAN. Th these are essentially the characteristics of, of that deployment option. Another option, of course, is to run Spectrum Protect on NSD clients. The, the two options here on NSD client and this Elastic Storage Server is essentially the same topology. The Spectrum Protect servers run on NSD clients. The difference here is that these NSD clients are connected via TCP IP or InfiniBand to the NSD servers. And the NSD servers have shared storage access via SAN to the LAN. All the NSD servers in the, in the right-hand side uh, with the ESS, the NSD servers are in the ESS. So the ESS essentially simplifies this deployment option by collapsing the NSD servers and the storage into one. The topology is the same like running TSM on NSD clients. When is this typically used? So the, the one in the middle is used when perhaps when GPF, when you have a larger cluster, when spectrum scale is used for other workloads in addition. You can use this storage option also when you want to use SAS attached storage to the NSD servers. I mean, typically this is limited to two D servers, but it, it would work. You would use the ESS deployment when you really want to offer an ESS to the client. Just keep in mind, application, application if you want to do spectral scale replication, which is synchronous across two sites, then this replication is done through the LAN. I worked with a couple of clients on solution designs and these clients had very good SAN connections between their data centers, but the LAN connection was not dedicated, and they couldn't guarantee low latency, high bandwidth. From, for that reason, for these clients, we always selected the leftmost option where Spectrum Protect runs on the NSD servers. So these are the deployment options you have. What we see most of the time, and to me the most simplistic way to implement this, is running TSM on NSD servers. Replication options, so there are two options replicating data. One is the spectrum scale synchronous replication, shown on the left-hand side. One, you have instances running in both sides on NSD servers, uh, and each spectrum protect instance writes data twice, one to the local storage box and one to the remote storage box. I mean, this is essentially facilitated by spectrum scale as a file system. This replication is synchronous. And it's really focused on high availability. The high availability aspect here comes in if an instance fails, for example, on the left-hand side here, it's very quickly restarted on the right-hand side, okay? Because the file system is available across both sites. That we don't have to, to worry about importing volume groups and resolving reservation con conflicts on LANs and stuff like that. The file system is just available across both sites, so it's very easy to restart an instance which failed on one side to restart it on the second side. So this solution is primarily made for high availability, and of course, it is one cluster which stretches across both sites. The second method for replication is Spectrum Protect Node Replication. That is asynchronous. You ha essentially have two independent clusters, one on the right-hand side, one on the left-hand side. The Spectrum Protect instances replicate nodes between the instances on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side. This solution is primarily made for disaster recovery. If one site fails completely here, you can easily, you have to, to fail over to the secondary site to continue operations. This, this failover requires still manual interventions, especially if you want to write data into the, into the other server. From that perspective, really focus on disaster recovery. Also, the Spectrum Protect node replication, from my perspective, is the most consistent way to replicate data uh, because Spectrum Protect really has the knowledge about the data and the metadata for the object associated with the node. The Spectrum Scale Synchronous Replication on the left-hand side doesn't have this awareness. It knows it has a file system for database. It knows it has a file system for storage pools, but it, it doesn't have, it doesn't understand the concept of transactions within TSM. Okay, so these are the replication options that we typically see. Either clients already use, for example, like with this client, he used Logical Volume Manager across two sites. If a client uses Logical Volume Manager across two sites, it's very simple to position spectrum scale synchronous replication. 
if a client uses node replication, it's more simple to position node replication as the replication. Or we also have clients who want to flip from, from an LVM-based mirror into a node replication. Okay? So it's just part of the client requirement which need to be considered to make a proper solution design. One other thing we need to be aware of is are the different workloads from a Spectrum Protect instance. So in this table, you see different workloads in Spectrum Protect. We first have the database workload, which is small blocks, random read-write I.O. So we really need fast storage, which means low latency. For the active log, we have smaller blocks and sequential write activities typically. We use also faster storage. It should be separated from the database. For the active log, we have medium-sized block sizes, sequential writes. So we, we use medium fast storage and we should separate this from the active log. We can have the archive failover log, which is larger blocks, and we have the storage pools, which is also larger blocks, typically sequential read write I.O. For storage pools, we use also medium fast storage devices uh, and separate this from the database. And maybe we put the metadata for this storage pool file systems on a faster storage as well, because storage pool file systems can have a lot of files in there. This is just an introduction to, to the different workloads in Spectrum Protect, and it may give you a hint that we may have to do different designs for the storage, for the database, for the storage pools, and for the logs. I'm, I'm going to explain the Spectrum Scale building block concept. Okay, so a building block is comprised of uh, running GPFS and TSM, the associated network to the client and to the, to the storage, uh, and the storage itself. Okay, so what you see on the right-hand side is essentially a building block. The, the building block is designed individual for each client because it's, it's designed to deliver performance and capacity according to the client requirement baseline. So we select the storage system according to the required throughput. We select the server according to the workload and preferences, preferences in regard to platforms and operating systems. Uh, and then we have to fit in the networks, right? Uh, the networks are, are key in the solutions uh, to accommodate the throughput end-to-end -end from the client to the storage and back. The, the building block design is very much dependent on the deployment option we select. In this example here, we have selected the deployment option with TSM running on NSD servers. This building block could be more complex if you select TSM running on NSD client. And also the number of servers, the storage system and network is really dependent on what this particular building block needs to accommodate. And that is very much dependent on the client requirements. The purpose of building blocks is a little bit also standardization. You create one building block which can run a number of TSM instances with a certain characteristic from a capacity and performance uh, point of view. And if you have to grow this environment, you add the same kind of building block to it. You have a standardization in the building block. And in order to grow, you just add building blocks. So this is the concept of building blocks. And of course, a building block, once you have established this, it, it's much easier to size. We have to look at the architectures again uh, from Spectrum Protect and Spectrum Scale. And we have several components here. We have the network between client and server. In order to achieve a certain throughput, this network must be able to provide the throughput. We have the TSM server itself running on, on a server platform, right? It also must be able to accommodate certain workloads. So the TSM server itself is a component, the server hardware. Then we have a network between the TSM server running on a, on a GPFS client and the GPFS server. This is the LAN network, an Ethernet network, or InfiniBand network. And this network must be able to accommodate the performance objectives from the client down to the storage. But of course, if you have multiple TSM servers here, you need to accumulate that bandwidth for that network between the GPFS client and the server. And then we have the GPFS NSD servers itself. They need to provide a certain level of reliability, high availability, and of course, they must be able to accommodate the TSM server workload. Again, we have multiple TSM servers, we may have multiple TSM servers, and the NSD servers should be able to accommodate, must be able to accommodate the workloads for all TSM servers. And then we have the network between the servers and the 
the storage itself. Of course, this again must be able to accommodate the required bandwidth and latency. And then we have the GPF storage that must be configured to provide the required capacity and, of course, the performance for all TSM servers. From that perspective, it is important to, to get the statistics or the requirements for all instances and then accumulate it in order to do appropriate sizing. Now, as you see, this architecture is fairly complex because it, this is the GPFS client server architecture. You can simplify that, for example, by using an ESS box. That replaces the entire second half of this picture, as you can see, uh, because the ESS, ESS includes the NSD server, the network to the storage, and the storage itself. Of course, you can run the TSM server on NSD server. This doesn't work with ESS, unfortunately. If you want to run the TSM server instances on GPFS NSD servers, you cannot use ESS for that. You need to, to use native deployment. But still, this architecture is really it takes out a couple of components out of this picture, like the network between the GPFS client and the GPFS client uh, running the TSM servers itself. We, ha we have another concept about building block. You know, a building block is the number of TSM server running on GPFS in a GPFS cluster and the associated storage with that. And now we have to look for certain infrastructure components. In many cases, these, the selection of the infrastructure components is dependent on the client requirements. So for example, the servers running GPFS and TSM, you have the choice between the x86 platform and uh, IBM Power. It, it really depends on the client requirement. You have the choice of operating systems. You can Linux or ARX or even Windows for that. And of course, you need to look after the server resources, you know, how many memory you need, CPU, and stuff like that. In particular, that is important when you run TSM in in virtual machines, being it power LPARS or KVM or VMware virtualized machine. Then you really have to look after the, the server resources to see if it can satisfy the accumulated requirements TSM servers running on this platform. The next one is the networks. It's very important. In the simple picture, you see that separate the TSM client network from the storage network. In particular, if the TSM client network and the storage network is both based on IP, don't put them together. They can go into into the same switch, like 10 gigs, 10 gig Ethernet switch, but it should should be different VLANs. And of course, when using SAN, disk, and tape, separate the workloads for disk and tape on a SAN level. Now for selecting the storage, there's a whole choice of things you can you can use. Select the storage also to accommodate capacity and performance baseline requirements. Provision faster storage for the TSM database and the logs. With deduplication, we definitely recommend flash or SSD. Without deduplication, it's not the wrong choice. Uh, you should not put data database and logs on the line SAS drives in any way. And for storage, for the TSM storage pools, you may select high capacity storage, larger disk drives, near line SAS drives, and stuff like that. When you run storage pool migration and backups from the disk storage pools to tape, for example, you may look into faster disk storage there to accommodate the performance. It's really dependent on the requirement. How much time do you have to migrate or backup a certain amount of data? It gives you the accumulated throughput, and this is what you need to provide here from a disk storage perspective and from a network perspective. The infrastructure selection really is one of the parts which you do based on the requirements you have from the client. You haven't looked into the sizing of these components yet, right? This is something we do later. When you do the sizing of these components, you may realize that you have to go to a different model of this system or to a different model of server anyway. Okay? This just gives you an idea of what, what kind of infrastructure components need to be considered, need to be collected in order to really establish a high-level solution architecture. The key, this is the, the outcome of the solution design phase to uh, create a high-level solution architecture, which is comprised of one or more building blocks. So in the course of the solution design, we have selected a deployment option. We know what replication we are using. We have planned for additional TSM functions like deduplication, like migration and backup to tape. We have established the performance requirements for all the instances plus the additional workloads we have. We have established capacity requirements. We have established a building block. Based on that, we have pre-selected the infrastructure and validated this against client requirements. 
a high level solution architecture looks like this. And typically, once you really think in the way of building blocks, you have done this 50 minutes after you know the client requirement. You have created this high level architecture. Because this high level architecture is just kind of a component model. Also, this is a building block here. And now we are going to size this building block in the next phase. In the next phase, essentially, we take the building block uh, and size each individual component and validate it against the client performance and capacity requirements. We have our building block established with servers running GPFS and or TSM, depending on the deployment model, included networks for the client network, server network, and storage network. And we have included storage systems for the database and for the storage pool. We have the building block. We have established the accumulated TSM instance requirement for performance and capacity. Performance includes the client backup performance we need, plus the housekeeping performance we need. One point may be that, that you have a shorter time window for migrating the daily ingest off to tape or for replicating the daily ingest into another TSM server. You may need more speed, essentially, for housekeeping operations like node replication than you need for daily backups. So from that perspective, it is very important to establish the baseline for these additional operations as well. So once we have this, we have the building block, we have the, the, the requirements and the required performance and capacity numbers. Uh, now we size the building block based on the selected hardware. We size the storage according to the required throughput and capacity. We choose TSM server according to the TSM blueprint, and we fit in the network to match the required throughput. And again, we may, may need more building blocks in order to accommodate client spec tech landscape. Now let's look into sizing these components. The server sizing, the server may run TSM and GPFS, or only one of them, really depending on the deployment option, but it doesn't really matter. Our assumption is that a well-sized server can separate the network and the disk, so the server is not going to be the bottleneck. That is our assumption. And really the server, the server parameters, the server configuration you get from the blueprints. Blueprints include servers running one instance. Now if you want to run multiple instances on one server using virtualization techniques, you have to perhaps double the resources in the server, right? Because multiple instances need more resources like CPU, RAM, and so on. So using to select the server is fairly simple. The blueprints show different t-shirt size configuration for single TSM servers. They are based on TSM deduplication, which is not bad. You know, if a server is made for deduplication, it very well runs without deduplication. Blueprint really helps to determine the server and the storage configuration for a given uh, TSM instance based on the client requirement. With the blueprints, there also come scripts for automated deployment of the TSM servers. And the blueprints are available for Power and X86 uh, servers. Now, the essential concept behind the blueprint really is, and I'm referring to this blurry table on the, on, on the bottom part left-hand side. The blueprints have t-shirt size, small, medium, large. From the client requirement, you know the daily interest into a given TSM instance. And you know the total capacity managed by the server. Now, with this now, you can, you can say, this is a small TSM server, a medium-sized TSM server, or a large one. Once you know this, you assign the, the, the blueprint, essentially, for each TSM server. Okay? So for example, a small server accommodating up to 4 terabyte a day uh, with 10 to 50 terabyte total capacity managed, you know, this is your blueprint. Right? So you need 6 cores, eight, 12 cores total for the server. You need 64 gigabyte memory, uh, and this is an X blueprint, an x86 blueprint, right? So you already know the characteristics of your server. You see also the storage, the blueprint also includes the storage. Um, and you can very well use the storage with GPFS as well, right? So it's not limited to non-GPFS deployment. You can size the same kind of storage for a GPFS deployment. The only thing you have to consider is, let's say you run multiple small instances, this storage here will only serve, able to serve one TSM instance. Okay, so you have to double that, essentially, to serve two TSM instances. But once you're familiar with the, with the blueprints, it's really easy to derive a server sizing. And these blueprints, as I said, are also available for, for, for the Power Platform. With native, with native deployment, what I mean with native deployment is everything which is not ESS. You simply use this magic to size a storage system, right? You know what is the accumulated throughput 
uh, end capacity for your storage based on the TSM instance requirement, and you enter that into disk magic and, and size your block storage for that. Right? You know, you can consider different weight levels for database and uh, storage pools, but you use disk magic. With ESS deployments, there's a sizing tool for ESS available, also linked here. We have some more elaboration on that. It's important to put the TSM database and logs on faster storage. An ESS with nearline SAS drives cannot mask the latency of a nearline SAS drive. ESS is very good for sequential workload, uh, but it cannot mask the latency of nearline SAS drives. From a capacity planning perspective, there are two things to consider. One thing is, for each file system you're creating, you should plan some additional capacity for the file system metadata. That is a GPFS thing. Okay, so GPFS has files the metadata, which requires some capacities. The really very rough rule of thumb is 1 to 3 percent, which typically is way too much. For better metadata capacity calculation, there's a good topic in the GPFS wiki about it. This is a configuration item for GPFS. If you separate the metadata for the storage pool file system, give it a smaller block size, uh, you can also save a lot of metadata capacity. So this is the first thing. You need to add some additional capacity, some additional storage capacity for the metadata. And it generally should don't, don't size your storage system on the limits to be filled at 100%. GPFS doesn't like to be filled at 100%. Okay, so add another 10 to 20% just for future growth. Now, if you look into the storage types by workload, as mentioned, we have different workloads for the TSM instances. And we recommend different storage types, as you see here. You know, like the database can be put on SSD or flash or SAS drives. We recommend these rate levels with these uh, storage types and so on. Okay, so this gives you a good guidance when you, you have selected a storage system. And this gives you a good guidance what kind of disk you should have in there and how the rate is going to be configured, which, of course, is required by disk magic in order to do all the calculations. The next thing to be sized is the network. If you run the TSM on NSD servers, TSM instances use the SAN to access the storage. It's very simple here. You need to size the SAN, absorb the required workload, right? You know what each instance requires, how many gigabytes per second it needs, and that is what the SAN has to be del has to deliver. And in order to scale this up, you add SAN ports to your servers, right? And you may add fabrics and stuff like that. In the constellation or the deployment option where the TSM servers run on NSD clients, we have LAN connections between the TSM server and the NSD servers. The general guidance here is that the T a TSM server should have one connection for two NSD servers. Like in this example, we have the TSM server running on a GPFS client connected to two NSD servers with storage. And the connection link here is 10 gigabytes per second. Okay, so this TSM server needs, needs two 10 gigabyte Ether Ethernet ports at least, I recommend four for high availability in two fabrics. The maximum throughput you can achieve in this setup here is two times 10 gigabytes per second, which is roughly two gigabytes per second. You cannot get more out of that. If you use GPFS replication, so let's say these two T NSD servers here are stretched across sites and we replicate all the data, your TSM server throughput is cut by half. So it's only one time 10 gigab gigabit. Of course, we have to write the data twice. Channel trunking, LACP, Ether channel, and you name it, may allow multiple connections from one TSM server to one NSD server. Our general recommendation is to not count on this unless you really have experience that it works. It seems to be very platform dependent. So the baseline here is the max throughput you can get from a TSM, the number of NSD servers times the network speed. Okay. And of course, you can scale this by adding another NSD server. You can get to three times 10 gigabit. From the network perspective, as mentioned before, separate the TSM client network from the storage network here and separate the SAN ports for disk and tape. So at the end of, this, of the sizing phase, we have a building block. We have sized the building block, TSM and cheaper servers accommodating the world workloads with the networks. And again, the networks are really key. You have to think about the networks if you do this kind of exercise. So the network can really accommodate the throughput end-to-end -end from the client to the disk. And of course, we have sized this system to accommodate the required throughput and capacities. And with this, we can refine our high-level solution architecture with more specific 
components like we have Power8 servers, we can add how much gigabyte RAM we need and how much memory we need, how much cores we need. We have specified the sun fabrics and so on. Okay, so this is really the outcome of the, of the sizing phase. You have a detailed architecture where all components are named and characterized. Now let's go into the last phase, configuration, storage configuration. One of the key things, storage configuration, we recommend to have four to five file systems for all Spectrum Protect instances. So this is going to be one file system for the database on SSD, hopefully. Also, how many lines you should at least provision. Each line is going to be an NSD for GPFS. And you also see the guidance for the GPFS block size. And some other guidance in the notes column where we say, well, you should have six or more directories per instance. Okay. Now, the way you can envision this, you have one file system for all databases. In this file system, you have one subdirectory for each TSM instance where the TSM instance stores the database. And this subdirectory may actually be a GPFS file set. It doesn't have to be. It could be. It doesn't hurt. If you make it a GPFS file set, it gives you the option to, to put quotas on it. Okay, So you can give each TSM instance a quota for, for each file system. And likewise, we have a file system for the active log, for the archive log, for the storage pools, and the archive failover log. And the last one here is just is not a file system, but the separation of the metadata uh, for the storage pool file system. If you put the metadata for the storage pool file system on separate disk, this disk needs to have characteristics, and this is what is shown here. Okay, so for the metadata for the storage pool, we recommend fast disk, two or more lines, and the metadata block size should be 64k. For the Actual storage configuration and the file system configuration, we have the database and log on faster disk. With deduplication, it is really absolutely recommended to use SSD or flash. For the storage pools, we have the storage pool file system on high-capacity disk, typically provided by normal disk arrays with standard rate mechanism. One thing beneficial here is to match the strip size of a disk array to the GPFS file system block size. If you have RAID 6, 8 plus 2P, and your stripe size is, your, your stripe size per disk is 256K. The full stripe size is 2 megabytes. We have 8 disk, 8 data disk. It's 8 times 256K is 2 megabytes. So your file system block size should be 2 megabytes for the storage pool. If this is the case, we can really benefit from entire file systems blocks being written onto the storage, which makes it really fast and creates low overhead. Also, the general recommendation is to create a low number of larger LANs per RAID array, understanding the previous recommendation to have at least six to eight uh, LANs for the storage pool file systems available. Okay, but don't create hundreds of LANs, right? With ESS deployments, you're not bound to the strip size of an array. We typically use larger block sizes for the storage pools as well. I have some more guidance later on. Put the storage pool files, the metadata on faster disk, especially if you have lots of storage pool volumes in your file system created by, by multiple TSM instances. And I previously skipped the V7000 specific considerations, show you the solution based on the example I've presented before. The client requirement captured in my requirement table is here. If I briefly look over that, we have to accommodate 3 gigabytes per second throughput. We need to provide 10 terabyte for the database, 10 terabyte for the storage pools. We have high availability requirements in two locations, we need the provision for a storage pool backup and migration, and the client wanted to use the Power7 uh, platform as AIX, wanted to continue to use that. Okay? So one of the things you typically do is when you create and size your building, your building block, so you have to make some architectural decisions okay, based on the client requirement. These are the architectural decisions we, we took for this, or for this particular solution. We decided to use a native deployment with GPFS. We, we presented ESS. When I say native, it, is, it means non-ESS. We presented ESS to the client. The client was very interested. But the client also realized that he doesn't have the infrastructure between the data centers. The data centers are 25 kilometers away, and the client doesn't have the Ethernet infrastructure we need, providing low latency and high bandwidth. But the client had perfect sun between these two data centers. So we said, let's go with the native deployment and let's leverage your perfect sun. We used GPFS replication just because the client used LVM before. Switching to GPFS replication is fairly transparent. To them. We used the existing Power7 servers because uh, the client wanted to continue to use these. 
and he has experience with PSM and AX. And of course, we decided to reuse Power HA as, as well because client has experience with that. We also decided to continue to run four TSM instances on one LPAR. I'm not a fan of that, but the client is in use with that. He knows the limitations. He runs this for years. So why why bother? The client wants it, he gets it. One important discussion we had, because it's it's, it's stretch cluster kind of implementation where if two sites we use GPFS application in between, was a, was about a quorum node, right? We needed to provide an additional quorum node in a separate location. This was quite a discussion with the client, but once he re realized he has the GPFS license already, it wasn't a big deal. Okay? He, he allocated a small virtual machine uh, in an additional office building he had, and we set this up as a quorum node with file system descriptor disk. And we, we used flash system for the TSM database and V7000 with 10K SAS drives for the TSM storage pools for two reasons. The client is familiar with flash system and V7000. We needed the 10K SAS drives to stay within the required capacity and provide the, the required performance. The building block. So one building block we designed was essentially you know, this one Power 7 L power running for instances, a V7000 system, a flash system, and tape storage for storage pool migration. We reused the, the existing tape storage. So this is one building block. It can deliver the requirements shown here. And we just took this building block and put it on the other side and made it one cluster. This is the solution architecture essentially. Two building blocks sized identically. GPFS replication in between power HA uh, for the high availability of the TSM server instances, and of course, this additional quorum node, which is a virtual machine. In summary, the, the solution works very well for the client. The client is very satisfied with the solution. It runs stable. The client, uh, you know, it provides the capacity and performance he, the client needs. He's running this now since end of last year. One of the key aspects to the client is also that it provides the required high availability and disaster protection. The client tested is he, he can tolerate an outage of one data center and continue to run on the other data center. And one, one important thing the client noticed is that the failover with Power HA is much faster. We, we, don't, we don't have to use LVM, have to do all these kind of things, importing wild groups, taking files things online and stuff like that, because everything is online at the other side. This was one example how simple the solution design can be once you know how to do it. Now I'm turning back to Trisha for the questions, if there are any. Yeah, Neil. The question was, um, with scale, do you still need power HA in the design? Well, well, power, yes. Let me say it depends on the client requirements. Power HA does, in addition to scale, it, it moves the resource group, right? If TSM fails on one side, power HA restarts it automatically on the other side. Scale would cannot do that, right? Scale cannot start TSM. Okay, for that reason, you need Power HA to improve high availability, which means reduce downtime. I know a, a couple of clients who don't use Power HA. They are also running in an AIX environment. They don't use Power HA, but they have their own script. But with their own script, it means if a TSM instance fails on one side, they have to come in and start this script in order to bring up the TSM instance on the other side, right? So it's semi-automated. Power HA can fully automate that. Great. So thank you again, Neil, for um, presenting this, this in-depth information. And thank you, everyone, for attending.